and here I am about to start this session. So today we'll be talking about abnormal labor and CPD. CPD stands for cephalopelvic disproportion. We will discuss it in detail. Uh, first, we will be discussing about abnormal labor. But before going through the abnormal labor, uh, you guys should have understanding of the normal labor, how it goes and how it leads to delivery. And in case of any abnormality, how it leads to abnormal labor and end up in cesarean section. So understanding of normal labor is essential to understand what is abnormal so uh, objective of uh, this lecture uh, uh, you guys sh should be able to recall phases and assessment of the progress in labor in a normal situation and different terminologies and types which we use to describe an abnormal labor or the findings of abnormal labor understand its significance and complications and uh, we should manage uh, abnormal labor before it ends up and any of the complications. Determinants of labor, the presence of dysfunctional normal labor is seen, especially on the partograph. And definitely understanding of partogram, which we have already taught you guys uh, during what classes and uh, how, uh, and then we in the end, we will be discussing about cephalopelvic disproportion. So uh, it is basically failure to meet uh, and define milestones. Failure to meet or define milestones. Time limits for this is a specific time limit uh, in during which a normal labor if I'm being crossed and th this labor is taking uh, more uh, the time more than normal, then we will label it as a normal labor. And now you guys should be knowing what is when there's a normal labor. So uh, there can be multiple causes of normal labor like fetal malpresentation or multiple pregnancies or uterine scar. We will be discussing these things in detail. So uh, here is the phases of labor. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a latent phase, then there's an active phase. And active phase is further divided in the first stage and the second stage. Uh, in the latent phase, uh, there's a progressive and slow dilatation of the cervix. And so uh, there's not only dilatation, but the cervix get ripened. So, uh, before labor, the cervix consistency of cervix is not that much soft as it becomes during labor. So during latent phase, all these things are going. So uh, cervix, which is normally around three to four centimeter in length, gets shortened in length during the latent phase, gets little dilated, up to three to four centimeter during the latent phase, and then the active phase start in which the uh, duration of dilatation is shorter as compared to the latent phase. So uh, you can see in the graph, uh, in first eight hours of labor, during which uh, uh, the mother experiences little pain or the uh, pains are of less intensity, uh, it lasts for around eight hours. And during this time, you can see on the vertical axis, dilatation is uh, about four till four centimeter. That's the latent phase. Then after the latent phase, active phase start during which uh, there is a accelerated phase during which uh, the patients experience contractions frequently and more frequently as compared to the latent phase and the cervix dilated progressively and end up in the full dilatation of the cervix that is 10 centimeter as you can see on the top of the graph and then the baby deliver and if baby do not deliver after 10 centimeter dilatation we call it secondary arrest or the arrest of labor okay so how the assessment of the progress in labor is determined uh, in normal patient or in the normal labor the uh, time required for dilatation is one centimeter per hour in primary gravity it means uh, once the uh, once the patient has entered in the active phase of labor she has passed the latent phase 
her dilatation of the cervix should occur at least one centimeter per hour. It means if her labor has been started, active phase has been started from four centimeter, she should be around nine to 10 centimeter dilated in next six to seven hours. But in primary gravida, this time is uh, is little shorter. Uh, primary gravida or the multi gravida, uh, sorry, multi gravida progresses uh, earlier and they require less time for delivery. That's why uh, time limit is 1.5 to 2 centimeter per hour in multi gravida. And definitely, along with the dilatation of the cervix, the head of the baby should descend in the pelvic cavity. Here is a uh, a partograph. Uh, this is only the uh, portion of the partograph. This is not the whole partograph. Uh, the purpose is showing. Uh, purpose is to show only the graph, how it uh, progress. And uh, th this is this portion of the partograph is known as cervicogram, which shows how the cervix is dilating along with the time. So you can see uh, the purple lines showing latent and uh, normal labor. In normal labor, uh, there is a latent phase till three to four centimeter. Usually, and uh, according to the new guidelines, we take it till four centimeter, but you can take it at till three centimeter as well. So uh, during latent phase, progress is little bit slow. It takes uh, more time, but once the patient is has entered in the active phase, it should be dilated at one centimeter per hour, and it keeps on dilating. This is the normal labor. In normal labor graph uh, goes um, in a steep uh, way and it till it becomes 10 centimeter dilated and the delivery occurs. What happens in, now there are different terminologies for abnormal labor because um, if someone asks you what kind of abnormality you have uh, diagnosed in this labor, so you must be able to define it. Uh, like uh, the first thing is primary dysfunctional labor. Primary dysfunctional labor means, of course, the word indicates dysfunctional labor means labor is not uh, well uh, going and it's not functioning well. But the primary dysfunctional labor means since the start of labor, since the start of labor, it was slow. That is called primary dysfunctional labor. Since the latent phase, you were exp expecting some kind of delay, some kind of abnormality and Although patient entered in the active phase, but still in active phase, the labor is slow. So the labor was slow throughout in the latent phase and in the active phase. This is called primary dysfunctional labor, which was slow since the beginning. Then comes the secondary arrest. Secondary arrest is usually uh, diagnosed late because initially you can see with the, uh, in the blue line initially the labor was and the graph or the curve was along with the line of normal labor in secondary arrest what happens the labor is going is progressing normally it's fine but a time comes when the cervix stop dilating like in this graph you can see at seven centimeter dilatation service has stopped dilating with the time being in all in the next four to five hours cervix was unable to dilate further and at seven centimeter it ceases so this is called secondary arrest in which initially labor was going well but then it gets it get arrested so this is called secondary arrest now the prolonged latent phase there are many labors in which the latent phase is prolonged but once the patient has entered the active phase it goes normal it goes normally so during that prolonged latent phase, the patient is at, and the patient and the baby is at risk of uh, many complications like maternal stress. And especially if the uh, mother is having any comorbidities or any cardiac disease, or she's hypertensive and her blood pressure is uncontrolled. So prolonged lat latent phase can be dangerous for her. And uh, with the baby, the same goes with the baby. Baby can become hypoxic if there's prolonged latent phase. And Maybe can pass meconium. So uh, during prolonged latent phase, we have to be very vigilant. But in some, in many cases, there's initially prolonged latent phase. But once the patient has reached the active phase, it goes normally and it progresses well. So these are the different terminologies we use for abnormal labor, primary dysfunctional labor, which is abnormal since the beginning till the end. Then secondary arrest, which was initially going normally, then the cervical dilatation ceases and it gets arrested. And then the prolonged latent phase. So these are the different abnormalities of partogram. Um, 
okay if you guys have any question you can ask in the chat box well uh, i will answer uh, your queries during lecture and at the end of the lecture as well so here you can see uh, the partogram and we have already taught partogram uh, in your ward class classes maybe you can't recall exactly but you must be able to recall this picture and it's uh, also available in your book uh, in uh, this is the uh, upper uh, middle part of the partogram, which is called cervicogram. You can see uh, different uh, graphs. Uh, the green dotted line is normal labor in which uh, there is a slow uh, progress in the latent phase. And once the patient has achieved the active phase, there is a rapid progress and it's going up in prolonged latent phase which shows blue line it means the latent phase is going very slowly but in the particular it has not been shown well so don't go for it then primary dysfunctional labor which is slow since the beginning till the end then secondary is purple line which was initially going normally but at one point it get arrested and unable to progress more Okay, uh, here uh, questions are coming. Uh, what are different causes of these abnormal labor? I will explain you. Uh, can you explain the partogram in a bit more detail? We were not taught through this. Uh, okay, uh, part of, uh, teaching partogram on the online lecture won't be possible, but I can tell you a few things. Uh, in this partogram, hope you guys can see uh, cursor of my mouse. Uh, I am not sure whether you guys can see cursor of my mouse or not. Uh, here you can see uh, in the upper part, there are small boxes which shows um, fetal heart rate. Then comes to the second part of the partogram. Uh, if we can, goes towards the bottom, um, in the second part, you can see uh, there's a liker and molding. And then in the middle part, you can see uh, where the colored lines has been shown. And this is the cervicogram, which basically shows how much cervix is dilating with time and how much uh, descent of head can be seen through vaginal examination and through abdominal examination. So this is uh, this portion shows uh, how much cervix is dilating and how much baby's head is going inside the pelvic cavity and um, so it can deliver vaginally. Then in the uh, then below this part, uh, there's a small boxes again, and you can see the large black box as well. These are showing basically uterine contractions, uh, how severe uterine contractions were. If they are mild contraction, you will see mildly shaded box. If they are severe contraction, you will see darkly shaded box. As you can see in this cartogram, there are black, dark black shaded uh, boxes. It shows the uterine contractions are at maximum. Then um, in the uh, then below this, uh, the, uh, there's a documentation of IV fluids, what kind of fluids you are giving, whether you are giving uh, eutrotonic drugs like oxytocin or not. Then in the bottom part, uh, there's a blood pressure and pulse recording of the mother and the urine detail analysis report has been written in the partograph. So this is the basic idea. Uh, the main component of the partograph is uh, the upper two boxes, uh, one which is showing fetal heart rate and the second part, which is showing colored lines. Uh, this is actually the progress of labor. And uh, in this uh, lecture, we are basically discussing how the progress of labor becomes abnormal and we call it abnormal labor. So uh, there are different types of abnormal labor as we have already discussed those terminologies. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, the poor progress of the labor can be seen in the first stage and in the second stage. Hope you guys can recall what's the first stage. It's the dilatation till 10 centimeter of the cervix and second stage is the descent of the head. Second stage starts from the full dilatation of the cervix till the delivery of the baby. So uh, poor progress can occur during the first stage of labor and during the second stage of labor as well. But there are other things as well. Abnormal labor does not mean slow labor. It can be rapid labor as well, like precipitate labor. Precipitate labor means the patient delivered, uh, the labor pain starts and patient delivered within two to three hours. That is called precipitate labor. This is also dangerous because when the uh, when the mother delivers the baby rapidly, it means baby is going through uh, uterine, more uterine contractions and, and they are of high intensity. And, and definitely baby is at risk of hypoxia. And on the other hand, and, uh, 
on the other hand uh, the mother is also at risk because uh, in the precipitate labor when the labor is going very fast the pelvic muscles are dilating at higher um, rate as compared to the normal one in, norm in normal labor the fetal head pushes the pelvic floor and the pelvic muscles dilate slowly and it gives space to the baby to pass through it but in precipitate labor there is not much time for pelvic muscles to get relaxed and it can lead to uh, vaginal tears uh, after delivery so that's the um, side effect of precipitate labor and this is also abnormal uh, the other uh, causes can be malpresentation. If the baby presentation of the fetus is not normal, it can be uh, there can be fetal compromise. Whenever there is fetal compromise, baby will not try to come out through the vagina because baby is not able to cope up the uterine contraction. So and baby is already in compromise. So baby will not try to deliver vaginally on its own end because the delivery is not. In, the, uh, in delivery, there is not only the mother which is playing role. The baby is also uh, playing role in normal vaginal de delivery. Then trial of uterine scar. In trial of uterine scar, we have to be very vigilant and we don't uh, give so much time to the mother to uh, try for the labor and we have to take quick decisions. And multiple gestations and if there are more than one fetus and induced labor here's a question um can you explain the difference between malpresentation and malposition um uh, i need to, <laughs> to pelvis and baby to show it and uh, i can give you a basic idea uh, malpresentation means uh, which part of the baby is presenting in the vagina like uh, if the head is presenting in the vagina that is called the pelvic presentation. If the buttocks are in the uh, pelvic cavity, it, we call it breech presentation. If the baby is lying transverse uh, in the uterine cavity, so we call it shoulder presentation or the uh, limb presentation. So whatever part of the body uh, of the baby is facing the vagina, or it the part of the baby which will come out first during labor after at the time of delivery it's called male presentation now comes to the male position what is male position male position is actually uh, suppose the baby is having cephalic presentation which is a normal presentation it's not male presentation baby is having cephalic presentation but in even in cephalic presentation the occiput of the baby should be lying anterior to the mother the face of the baby should be facing sacral part of the mother. We call it occipital anterior position. So this is normal position. When the occiput of the baby is facing the pubic uh, bone or the anterior of the um, maternal abdomen, we call it occipital anterior position. So this is a normal position. If the occiput of the baby is lying posterior in the posterior of the mother's abdomen means the occiput is facing the sacral part so we call it occipital posterior position and if the head is in the transverse position like occiput is neither anterior nor posterior in fact it's lying on the lateral along with the lateral part of the body so we call it occipital transverse so that is position Presentation is the part of the baby which is facing vaginally. Position is the presenting part which is facing the uh, um, facing the sacrum or the pubic bone of the mother. So that is called malposition. I hope I'm clear. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Terminologies of poor progress and labor. Um, that's how we communicate with our colleagues whenever there is abnormal labor. Like this labor is progressing uh, in a poor way, or there's non progress of labor, or there's dysfunctional labor. All these are uh, synonyms kind of terminologies, but that's how we use in our practical uh, day to day life uh, when we are communicating with our colleagues, uh, labor dystocia. Uh, is uh, equivalent to the secondary arrest when the labor is going was going normally and uh, at some point it get arrested or it is not progressing anymore then cephalopelvic disproportion we will be discussing it later and obstructed labor
सो प्रोलॉन्ग लेबर और एबनॉर्मल लेबर देर आर थ्री थिंग्स विच डिटर्मिन द प्रोग्रेस ऑफ लेबर the one is power second is passenger and third is passage powers are uterine contractions which mother which is experienced by the mother the second is passenger which is the baby and third is passage which is the maternal pelvis so whenever there is problem in any of the three things we try to intervene we try to correct it if it is possible like powers if there are less uterine contractions we try to augment it like in uh, prolonged labors if there are more uterine contractions if the uh, mother is contracting at higher rate at high intensity we can slow down the contractions so uh, this is the power we can manipulate by inter- by doing interventions then passenger passenger is the baby uh, of course if there is mal presentation like presentation is breech presentation is shoulder or if there is mal position like although the baby is cephalic presentation but the head of the baby is not lying in the normal way as it should be in the maternal pelvis the normal position is occipital anterior if it is not occipital anterior then it they, you may encounter prolonged labor and then the passage passage means the maternal pelvis it should be roomy the maternal diameter should be adequate to allow the passage of the baby now let's move on so uh, power uh, power is dysfunctional uterine activity it means uterine uterine contractions are not adequate in coordinate uterine activity in coordinate means uh, sometimes uterus is contracting frequently and sometimes it's not so this is called in coordinate uterine activity and it also leads to prolonged labor then the other terminology is hypertonic but asynchronous uterine activity uterus may be hypertonic it is contracting more and more but it's not contracting at regular interval so this is called incoordinate or hypertonic uterine activity in in synchronous uterine activity okay then passenger uh, what can be the problems with the passenger passenger can be macrosomic if baby is too large it won't be able to pass through pelvic cavity if there is mal presentation as i already told you what is mal presentation if there is mal position or if the fetus is abnormal suppose uh, fetus is anencephaly fetus is not having head if the fetus is having any kind of uh, pelvic tumor any kind of uh, coccygeal sacral tumor or abdominal tumor or even in the uh, tumor is lying in the head so it will increase the diameter of the head and baby won't be able to deliver and sometimes uh, you must have heard about uh, conjoined twins Uh, in which the baby is uh, two babies are attached to each other so they are not they cannot be delivered vaginally so there can be many abnormalities with the fetus uh, which can lead to failure of the normal labor then the passage passage uh, uh, the causes of uh, poor passage or the abnormal passage can be contracted pelvis abnormal pelvis uh, means fetal diameters are not uh, appropriate to allow normal delivery uh, mother may have bony tumor in the pelvic bones mother may have history of fracture which may lead to um, a poor fusion and it can alter the diameters of the pelvic cavity which can lead to labor abnormal labor then soft tissue tumor of pelvis or the pelvic organ mother may have a uh, fibroid in the uterus which can obstruct the baby Uh, during passage through the birth canal then cervical dystocia uh, cervical dystocia is same like a uh, cervix was dilating uh, normally and suddenly it stops dilating so this is called cervical dystocia development of abnormal genital tract uh, if there is any abnormality in the genital tract means uh, there is vaginal septum there is uh, uh, two uterine cavities uh, there can be <clears throat> any kind of constriction ring in the cervix which can lead to uh, abnormal labor okay there is a question how would fetal tumor lead to delayed labor uh, what are tumors basically tumors are growth in any part of the body so if there is a tumor in the fetal head it will definitely increase the fetal diameter uh, or head diameter of the fetal head so baby won't be able to deliver if the baby is having tumor in the spine 
you must have seen uh, pictures in your book, Spina bifida or the protrusion of the meningomyelocele or any kind of tumor in the spine or the uh, coccygeal area, it will uh, obstruct the baby uh, to get out or the omphalocele or anterior seal, you must have uh, read about it. These are the some abnormalities or the kind of tumor, uh, fetal tumors, which obstruct the baby while delivering through the birth canal. So what are the patterns of dysfunctional labor in the first stage? <clears throat> first stage is still the 10 centimeter dilatation of the cervix. So uh, what can lead to the prolonged uh, first stage? Uh, it is prolonged latent phase. It means the patient entered in the active phase after a very long time in, uh, in the latent phase or the labor is primary, primarily dysfunction. It means it was dysfunction since the beginning or the secondary arrest means patient is at six centimeters, seven centimeter or eight centimeter and it's not dilating anymore. So these are uh, duration, uh, normal duration. Uh, if it exceeds uh, uh, with then this normal duration, it leads to the prolonged uh, phase. Like prolonged latent phase is called when there is more than 20 hours of uh, pain in latent phase in primary gravida or more than 14 hours in multigravida. Prolonged latent, uh, prolonged second stage when the mother is fully dilated and now the baby has to uh, come out through the birth canal we can at that time we can wait till two hours two to three hours in primary gravita if uh, there's epidural it means mother is unable to uh, do its her own effort so it will take a longer time like more than three hours and up till three hours and in multi paris up till one hour if it is more than one hour then we call it prolonged labor or the dysfunctional labor. And then protracted dilatation is called, we call dilatation is prolonged when uh, the progress is less than 1.2 centimeter per hour. In primary gravita or 1.5 centimeter in multigravita. Protracted descent, uh, of course, with the dilatation of the cervix, the head should descend in the pelvic cavity as well. So if the descent is less than one centimeter per hour, we call it prolonged. And in multi it should be, uh, it should not be more than uh, less than two centimeter per hour. Then arrest of dilatation, arrest of descent. Whenever there is arrest of dilatation, like in secondary arrest, cervix suddenly stop dilating. We don't label it as secondary arrest till we wait for some time. Like in primary gravida, we wait for two to three hours. Maybe uh, uh, cervix start dilating again as it was arrested before and it starts dilating again. So we wait to, till two to three hours in primary gravida and in one to two hours in multi gravida before we diagnose uh, labor as arrested labor. And then prolonged third stage, uh, it's different. Uh, it comes in the category of PPH. Prolonged third stage is called when there is more than 30 minutes. It means placenta is taking longer time in coming out. So uh, let's talk about prolonged latent phase. Uh, in prolonged latent phase, prolonged latent phase, uh, how, uh, what makes the latent phase to go on whenever uh, before going into the labor the cervix consistency is not as much soft as it is during labor so what makes it soft uh, basically the ground substances glycoprotein pledging content of the cervix and increased hydration of the cervix makes it soft so it can dilate up to 10 centimeter so uh, this is the factor which is important in the ripening of the cervix then effacement, uh, short, that is a shortening of the length of the cervix. The normal length of the cervix is around 3.5 to 4 centimeter. And in a patient who is already at term, a nine month pregnancy, the, you may have cervical length of up to three centimeter. So uh, when the patient has entered in the phase, phases of labor, it should get shortened with time. And here's a median duration, approx uh, eight point eight to nine hours of the duration is seen. Uh, and if it is more than that, we call it prolonged latent phase. Okay, now um, what can be the causes of prolonged latent phase? Uh, unripe cervix, as we 
discussed before uh, how uh, how the service get ripened then ineffective and inadequate uterine protection so this is the problem with the power as we discussed earlier so power can be uh, intervened can be manipulated with the drugs then abnormal fetal position position now again the terminology of position has come if occiput occiput of the baby is not anteriorly placed in the maternal abdomen it means there is if the position is not occipital anterior then the facing fetal head diameter of the baby will be larger than the normal only in the occipital anterior position the fetal and the smallest fetal diameter is exposed in the pelvic cavity but in abnormal mal uh, positions like occipital posterior or occipital transverse the presenting fetal diameter is larger than required and it leads to prolonged latent phase till the baby rotate on its own uh, otherwise it will end up in cesarean section then unrecognized pelvic disproportion it means the pelvis is short and it was not assessed or diagnosed that pelvic diameters are not adequate and dysfunctional labor it, it's a combination of all these things uh, and then we label it as dysfunctional labor primary dysfunctional labor is a prolonged labor since the beginning uh, and causes are poor and in coordinate uterine contractions cephalopelvic disproportion and mal men mal position such as occipital posterior position so if there is poor and in coordinate uterine contraction we can correct it with drugs if there is cephalopelvic disproportion we cannot correct it but at least we can diagnose it and take the appropriate decision then mal position mal position sometimes get corrected with uh, uterine contraction so we wait uh, for a specific time till it get corrected and if it it is not corrected on its own then definitely we have to end up in cesarean section then the secondary arrest uh, by definition it is the cessation of cervical dilatation following a normal period of active phase dilatation it affects 6% of the nulliparis and 2% of the multiparis even in the normal uh, in, in the patient who have history of normal deliveries we encounter a secondary arrest uh, due to any reason okay there is a question about uh, what is the pelvic disproportion we will be discussing in our next slides cephalo pelvic disproportion okay so what can be the causes of secondary arrest uh, there can be cephalo pelvic disproportion contracted pelvis or the mal position <clears throat> can lead to secondary arrest then complications of abnormal labor whenever there is um, pre precipitated labor speed up labor or the prolonged labor there can there can be complication with the mother and it can lead to complication with the mother and fetus in mother what we will encounter obstructed labor obstructed labor means the mother was having continuous was continuously having pain but the due to any cause the baby was not able to deliver vaginally and the time comes when it get stuck in the pelvic cavity it's not coming out but it is stuck there so this is called obstructed labor so this is a, an emergency and we have to do cesarean section immediately whenever obstructive labor is diagnosed sepsis sepsis is the reason because uh, whenever patient is in labor for prolonged time of course there will be more and more vagina examination more and more interventions so it can lead to ascent of infection through the vagina and it can lead to infection and then sepsis ruptured uterus whenever uh, baby is stuck in the pelvic cavity it's not coming out but the uterus is contracted uh, contracting as uh, it was uh, before so a time comes when uh, uterus can get rupture when the baby is not coming out and uterus is keeps on contracting <clears throat> and definitely uh, mother uh, in abnormal labor mother may end up in having operative delivery and operative delivery comes with the risk of anesthesia and definitely whenever there is prolonged labor risk of postpartum hemorrhage also increases and prolonged labor obstructed labor can also lead to vesico vaginal fistula so these are the maternal complication uh, then fetal complications of course birth asphyxia the baby will get hypoxic due to uh, continuous uterine contractions and the prolonged asphyxia can lead to the death of the baby that is stillbirth and even the baby is alive uh, 
baby may have neonatal sepsis due to ascending infection through the vagina and uh, having prolonged time inside the birth canal can lead to neonatal sepsis. Then syphil hematoma. Uh, syphil hematoma is very common because uh, whenever there is abnormal labor, it means the baby is stuck in the pelvic cavity and that pressure in uh, of uterine contraction along with the surrounding pelvic bone can lead to the syphil hematoma of the baby. And then uh, and skull fracture, uh, that is very rare, but uh, due to pressure uh, of the head uh, uh, from the pelvic bone can lead to skull fracture as well. Then diagnosis of prolonged labor, of course, uh, it is on the basis of history, since how long she's contracting, since how long she's in labor and examination will tell you that this labor is not going in a normal way. And uh, we have diagnostic um, tools as well, like part partogram and cervicogram. Partogram will uh, give us graph how the labor is going and it's slow or this uh, fast, it will tell us. Uh, then cervicogram. Cervicogram is the uh, part of the uh, partogram which I already showed. Uh, which shows the cervical dilatation, and that is called cervicogram. So uh, this is uh, the picture of partogram, and you can see the oblique lines. And this portion of the uh, partogram is called cervicogram, where we uh, see how the labor is progressing or it's dilating. Then how management should be done. Prolonged little phase, how you can manage it. Uh, as I already said, there are three uh, components of a normal labor, power, passenger. And passage. So uh, whenever there is abnormality uh, with any of the component, first you need to diagnose it and then you correct it. And along with the... Uh, 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 along with these three things, uh, what is important is reassurance of the patient, adequate analgesia to for the pain relief. Although you cannot relieve the labor pain at all, but at least you can uh, reduce uh, the intensity by giving analgesics. And uh, if the labor is not going uh, normal way, you can use the drugs for uh, enhancing uterine contractions. <clears throat> Okay, if the labor is primarily dysfunctional, it means it's going abnormal since the beginning, then what you can do? Optimization of maternal condition is the first thing you should be doing because mother should not get exhausted by pains. You should be uh, doing continuous monitoring for uh, vitals and the overall condition of the mother. There should be adequate hydration. If mother is unable to take orally, you can give IV fluid. There should be adequate pain relief. Uh, although you cannot relieve the pain 100%, but at least you can reduce the intensity of the pain for the mother. The, and a longer time will be required to allow the labor to progress in primary dysfunctional labor. And you can allow mother to mobilize. If she will walk, she will feel better. The baby, it will help in, um, it will help in the descent of the fetal head as well. And oxytocin can be given for augmentation. And if the prime dysfunctional labor is not progressing at all, and then you can end up in cesarean section as well. Okay, what can be the management of secondary arrest? Secondary arrest was the sudden um, arrest of the dilatation of the cervix. So, um, before, uh, what can be the cause? Uh, what should be uh, checked whenever you are diagnosing the secondary arrest? First, you need to check the fetal size or the estimated fetal weight. If the fetus is large and you are suspecting that it cannot come out uh, through the vaginal canal, that can be the possible cause of fetal uh, secondary arrest. Then degree of engagement, you need to assess how much head has been descent in the pelvic cavity because along with the dilatation, the fetal descent head uh, the descent of fetal head is also required. So you need to assess the degree of engagement. Then position of the presenting part is important because in most of the cases of secondary arrest, malposition is the cause. So position of presenting part is important uh, by doing vaginal examination. 
then you need to see sign of obstruction uh, like molding i hope you guys know what is molding uh, then uh, fetal well being should be assessed um, like uh, baby should be doing well uh, even if there is secondary arrest or prolonged labor and frequency of contraction should be assessed if the contractions has been ceased you can enhance the contractions by giving you tonics in cases of secondary arrest or you should be uh, assessing pelvic mass maybe the pelvic mass is in the lower region that's why labor was progressing and in a normal way initially and then it has been stopped due to uh, any of the pelvic mass in the lower uterine segment or in the vaginal canal and abnormalities of the bony pelvis like uh, in, in the bony pelvis uh, we have already read uh, there are three diameters and the um, anterior posterior then transverse diameters then uh, conjugate diameters and pelvic inlet pelvic outlet so uh, secondary arrest means the labor was initially normal so abnormality of pelvis maybe uh, the abnormality in the pelvis is in the lower part of the pelvis and upper part of the pelvic inlet was fine now pelvic outlet has having problem so that's why patient is having secondary arrest so there can be any abnormality of the a bony pelvis uh, which leads to second wear rest okay so management uh, if uh, you need to uh, if you need to enhance contractions you can give oxytocin and you can wait till 1 to 2 hours till the second wear rest uh, has been resolved or the cervix starts dilating again otherwise uh, such patient needs cesarean section now comes the cephalopelvic disproportion cephalopelvic disproportion is basically uh, happens when baby when you have uh, diagnosed during labor that this baby cannot be delivered vaginally and the cause is cephalopelvic disproportion disproportion it means either the fetal head the cephalic part of the baby fetal head is having a problem and it's not able to pass through the birth canal or maybe the fetal head is not having any problem but the pelvic cavity is smaller for a normal size fetus so um, whenever we call us call a terminology of cephalopelvic disproportion cpd it means either the problem is with the fetal head or the maternal pelvis so this is basically an anatomical disproportion between fetal head and maternal pelvis sometimes maternal pelvis are small but the baby is also small so it gets delivered vaginally so we don't call it cephalopelvic disproportion although the pelvis was small as compared to the normal pelvis considering the normal diameters of the pelvis maybe the specific uh, patient is having a smaller pelvis but if the baby is also small then it will get delivered vaginally and we will give trial of labor a normal labor in such patient but whenever there is cephalopelvic disproportion it means the uh, it happens in the uh, uh, other way like um, pelvis is uh, uh, normal all the diameters of the pelvis are normal but the fetal head is larger or the fetal position is not occipital anterior it's occipital posterior it's occipital transfer so the presenting diameter of the fetal head is larger and it's unable to accommodate in the pelvic cavity so it can lead to disproportion so it's it is basically uh, the anatomical disproportion between the fetal head or the diameter of the fetal head and the maternal pelvis okay in the, in the second line there's a, a word like it should be retrospective diagnosis after a well con conducted trial of labor so uh, we never uh, label up any patient as having cephalopelvic disproportion unless she goes in labor before going in labor we cannot label any patient as having cephalopelvic disproportion because during labor the fetal bones get overlap reduce the results in reduction of the diameter of the fetal head due to overlapping of fetal bones so it happens only during labor and on the other hand in the maternal pelvis uh, gets softened uh, the pelvic muscles get relaxed during labor so it also increases the pelvic diameter up to 1 to 1.5 cm so the term, term or the diagnosis of the cephalopelvic disproportion cannot be made unless the patient goes in the labor so it and that's why we call it uh, it should it cannot be diagnosed before labor the patient must undergo a trial of labor and then you can label someone as having cephalopelvic disproportion
okay in the third point uh, it's absolute or relative absolute means uh, you uh, are clear about uh, the diagnosis that uh, this mother like this mother is having history of tuberculosis or the rickets in the childhood or that this mother is having polio and you are sure sure that this uh, that her pelvis is not of normal diameters and it's very much shorter than the normal then you call it absolute cpd it means there's no chance of having a normal delivery and relative cpd when uh, the uh, problem is in the mother or the baby but you are not sure you need to give trial of labor so we call it relative cpd and in cases of relative cpd there's a 50% chance of normal delivery so we give a full trial to the mother Okay, causes and mother can be contracted pelvis, abnormal pelvis in the fetus. It can be macrosomia, malpresentation, malposition, asynchronism when the uh, fetal bones are not overlapping to each other in synchronous way. We call it asynchronism. Then abnormal fetus, um, hydrocaf, hydrops, thyroid, and neck tumor in the fetus can also lead to cephalopelvic disproportion. Okay, how the management is being done? Uh, we usually uh, try to augment the labor with oxytocin if the contractions are not uh, adequate. Uh, sometimes it leads not in all cases, uh, and most of the cases end up in operative delivery, like the section or the instrumental delivery. Okay, now uh, there's an, another terminology, poor progress in the second stage of labor. It means uh, the first stage of labor was going very well. The, uh, the latent phase and the active phase of the labor till the 10 centimeter dilatation of the service was going well. Now it's the time uh, for head to descend further unless the delivery occurs. Like there's a different and there's different with secondary arrest. This is not equivalent to the secondary arrest. Secondary arrest occurs in the first stage of labor. What happens in the second stage, the service is already fully dilated. So we won't call it secondary arrest, but the baby is not coming down. So we call it arrest in the second stage of labor or the poor progress in the second stage of labor. So uh, whenever a patient has has uh, reached till second stage of labor, we wait uh, till one hour in the multiparous women or two to three in primary gravidas. And again, causes are same, power, passenger or uh, passage. We need to exclude all the problems in these three factors to, uh, <clears throat> to, rule, uh, to manage poor progress in second stage of labor. Okay. In sense, usually uh, episiotomy is required, which is uh, causing uh, obstruction in the baby's head from coming out. So episiotomy can be given if the perineal muscles are very tight, they are not uh, relaxed enough to allow the baby to come out. So we can give episiotomy. We can opt for instrumental vagina delivery, like mother is not pushing well, maternal efforts are not well, we can go for forceps or vacuum delivery or the cesarean section can be done or even if there is little malposition if the head is slightly uh, mal rotated uh, then the oxygen anterior position then vacuum can help us but in cephalopelvic disproportion in cpd instrumental delivery will not help us then we need to go for cesarean section but um, otherwise if there is poor progress in the second stage of labor uh, you can uh, opt for these two things either episiotomy or the instrumental vagina delivery Precipitate labor, I've already explained. It's a speed up labor, uh, fast labor, and it can lead to medications. And the, one of the most common is uh, fetal asphyxia, fetal intracranial hemorrhage, or fetal distress. And uh, in the maternal, the common one is genital tract trauma, like laceration of the surface and vagina, because they're not getting enough time to get relaxed and dilate. And baby is just coming out in within no time. So it can lead to laceration and um, injuries, uh, then uterine virgin, postpartum hemorrhage, these all are common with the precipitated labor. Okay, uh, labor is in a special circumstances, like uh, if someone is patient is having this uterine scar, is the uh, there is malpresentation, like baby is not cephalic, it's breach or it's transverse or shoulder presentation. 
or there are multiple pregnancies more than one fetus or labor has been induced artificially with prostaglandin then these are some special circumstances in which the uh, diagnosis uh, of the uh, prolonged labor or abnormal labor is uh, different than in the normal cases like uh, if you are uh, delivering a patient if you are doing delivery of a patient with previous uterine scar then you cannot wait for two hours or three hours uh, to allow the progress of this labor or to allow the dilatation of the cell you have to take quick decisions because uh, with the uterine scar you are you have to be very much vigilant with the risk of having uterine rupture so um, but uh, the risk of uterine rupture uh, is 1 in 200, that is 0.5% if the patient is having history of cesarean section and now you are going to try for normal delivery. So there's 0.5% risk of having uterine rupture. So you have to be very careful and very vigilant. And uh, whenever there's uh, labor after previous cesarean section, so there's a terminology we use, VBAC or the TOLAC. VBAC is a, an old terminology, uh, which is stands for vaginal birth after cesarean section like history of cesarean section and TOLEG is trial of labor after cesarean section. So TOLEG is little uh, new terminology for it, but both are uh, interchangeable. So uh, trial of labor after cesarean section gives, but uh, uh, if we give trial of labor or we give uh, VBAC uh, in a patient with uh, history of cesarean section, there is a 70 to 80 percent chance that patient will deliver vaginally. So you don't need to go for cesarean section in all the patients who are having history of cesarean section. Okay, whenever there's previous cesarean sections, definitely during labor, you have to be very vigilant. Uh, you need to keep on assessing signs of uterine rupture. What are those signs? You will see fetal distress on CTG. You will see increased maternal pulse. You will see, uh, you will uh, observe scar tenderness on palpating the scar. So these are signs of uterine rupture. Whenever you feel these signs, you should immediately take patient to the OT for cesarean section rather than give, uh, trying for the normal delivery. Uh, then continuous electronic fetal monitoring is required because whenever there is fetal distress, we need to assess that um, uh, this uterine scar should not get rupture, should not get open. Otherwise, there will be disaster. And uh, whenever there is any problem uh, during labor, um, we cannot try or wait for one, two or three hours like we do in other patients. Uh, if patient is having uterine scar, previously uterine scar, we have to keep uh, threshold, our threshold low for cesarean section and we have to take quick decisions. Okay, labor with mal presentations. What are mal presentation? Breach, face presentation, bro presentation, shoulder presentation. These are mal presentations. Labor with mal, like if the patient is having breach presentation, then we, in the, what is recommended, we go for elective cesarean section. We don't give trial of labor to breach presentation, but it happens that uh, some, sometimes patient come during labor or patient arrived to hospital with five, six or seven centimeter duration with breach presentation. So in such cases, we go for vaginal delivery. Otherwise, our priority is to under, uh, to go for cesarean section in cases of breach delivery, which is the safest in uh, breach presentation. And then comes a face presentation. Face presentation means the fetal head is fully extended. Rather than in the fully flexed position, the fetal head is in fully extended position. And in fully extended position, um, delivery is possible only whenever there is uh, whenever there is mento anterior position, like on the left side, you can see uh, the head is fully extended rather than fully flexed, which is all uh, usual, which is the normal thing. And you can see uh, the head is fully extended. The presenting part of the baby is face. The part which will come out first during uh, after delivery and during delivery will be face. So this is called face presentation. And in face presentation. If the chin, which is called mento, if the chin is lying anterior to the maternal pelvis, mento anterior position. Now, after face presentation, I'm talking about position. If the position is mento anterior, then the vaginal delivery is possible. If the position is mento posterior, then vaginal delivery is not possible. Why? Because in mento anterior position, the, the fetal head was 
in the sacral hollow of the maternal pelvis so it was allowing the baby to come out and at, uh, during delivery when the head will be coming out the coccyx bone will move outward they are movable uh, at the time of delivery so the coccyx bone will move outward and it will allow the delivery of the fetal head but what happens in the mento posterior position the rounded part of the fetal head is facing pubic symphysis which cannot uh, be move here or there it's still it's stay there so it will get stuck and the face presentation with mento posterior position cannot be delivered vaginally this is the point of the bcqs so please keep in mind why mento anterior is delivered uh, is can be delivered vaginally and why mento posterior cannot be delivered vaginally so this is something logical uh, you should keep in mind and uh, your concept should be clear about it so you can uh, answer your bcqs and here you can see the picture uh, this is mento posterior position and this is how baby is trying to uh, come out through the vagina but it cannot because uh, with the pubic symphysis the occipital part of the fetal head has been stuck and this baby with mento posterior position cannot be delivered vaginally and suppose if this baby is in well flex position rather than hyper extended position so in well flex position it will be occipito anterior position which is the normal baby can be delivered but if the baby's head is not well flex it's hyper extended and the presenting part is face then occipito posterior I'm sorry mento posterior cannot be delivered <clears throat> Okay, the other is mal present. The other mal presentation is bro presentation in which the head is neither fully extended nor fully flexed. So uh, uh, it will face larger diameter in the pelvic cavity, and it will definitely lead to cesarean section and prolong after prolonged labor. Then uh, another mal presentation is shoulder presentation in, in which the baby's lie is transverse and the presenting part is the shoulder and which is of course not possible to deliver vaginally and these patient has to undergo uh, cesarean section and usually the causes of shoulder presentation are placenta previa or multiparity in which uterus is so relaxed and, and boggy that baby can, uh, keeps on changing position and it can present in shoulder presentation or the pelvic tumor like uterine fibroids or uterine anomalies. And these patient uh, definitely needs delivery by cesarean section. We should not give even trial of labor in such patient. And in multiple pregnancy, uh, we can try for the normal delivery in cases of twins, but not in triplets and quadruples. And even in twins, the leading twin should be in cephalic position. Uh, only you can and then only you can try for the normal delivery otherwise not and the induction of labor uh, is the artificial uh, induction of labor you initiate the labor artificially and definitely induction the process of induction of labor has risk of having uh, prolonged labor and uh, dysfunctional labor because it, it has been induced artificially <clears throat> So these are the references of the lecture. Uh, if you guys have any question, you can uh, ask quickly. Otherwise, we will finish the lecture. Okay, I will wait for further uh, one minute. Uh, if there's no question, then we will end the lecture. 